Our last speaker is Dr. Ayyappan, Chairman Life Springs Hospital. Dr. Ayyappan. Thank you, Mr. Sambatroda. Uh, distinguished speakers of this session, uh, distinguished participants, I am going to present before you an innovative and most affordable healthcare delivery system which we had executed almost five years and validated during the last four years. You all would agree that affordable healthcare is a distant dream for millions of people in developing countries. And expenses incurred on health will have a life-changing effect, especially for the disadvantaged sections in our society. Maternity is the second most common reason for hospitalization in India. And in India, we lose nearly 65,000 women every year. That means one in every eight minutes. If you take globally, this would work out to nearly 19% of the maternal deaths. And 70% of this death is preventable. And pregnancy is not a disease. As far as women in our country is concerned, we have three options, three choices. The public health institutions, we have private hospitals, and the third option is birthing at home. If it is public institutions, it is affordable, but it is low quality. When it comes to Private sector is a very high cost. Birthing at home with high risk. Now we are giving the fourth option. That is very high quality at an affordable price. Not affordable price, extremely affordable price. That is this model of Life Spring Hospitals. As Chairman was mentioning initially in his in introductory remarks, Innovation is all about executing new ideas to create value. It is not only piloting, it is executing. Now, I am going to talk about an idea which has been executed five years back and validated totally. This is possible. To give very high quality services at an extremely, extremely affordable cost. We thought that it was not possible. This is a country with 1.22 billion people. It was a market-based approach. It was not fully a philanthropic effort. Life Spring Hospital is actually a 20 to 25 bedded, extremely focused on single specialty maternal care. Whatever be the compulsion, we have not been changing our focus. At affordable cost, around 5,000 rupees, we charge 5,000 rupees, US dollar 80. For cesarean section, we charge 12,000 rupees around 125 dollars. Actually, the customer profile is they are from the informal sector, daily wage earners. Their average monthly income will be almost this amount, 6,000 to 7,000 rupees. Whereas, if they have to go to a private sector hospital, they will have to spend at least four to five months of their monthly income. It's a no-frill hospital and we are totally focused on maternity care. And we deliver in each and every hospital around 100 to 120 deliveries, whereas a similarly sized hospital delivers around 30 to 40. This was set up as a joint venture company between HLL Life Care Limited, which is a government of India company under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and Acumen Fund. Today we have 12 hospitals we follow a cluster approach so that expensive resources could be shared equally with all these things, all the hospitals. Currently, we offer prenatal care delivery and postnatal services. We have a laboratory, we have pharmacy, and we, have family, we offer family planning services. We have community outreach so that we, will be, we are in a position to increase the institutional delivery. What is that we offer? 
extremely affordable. Almost 50 percent is 60 percent to what other private sector hospitals charge. And we maintain very high quality services because we are focused only on maternity care. The most important thing is we are providing dignified delivery to women in this country. That is what they are missing in public health institution where it is affordable. That is very important. The, our whole model is centered on providing dignified delivery to women in this country. This is the Life Spring Hospital at Maulali in Hyderabad, Andhra Pradesh. This is a consultation. These are the beds. This is the general ward. Today we are providing this semi one million outpatients, low quality. Uh, low cost, high quality healthcare possible. We have proved that it is possible. Doctors and nurses are trained in protocol. It is totally process oriented methods. Reduce the workload in public hospitals. That is an important thing. Not only that, the hospitals in the nearby location, they have improved their service delivery. They have also reduced the cost. We could empower the community. We could improve the institutional delivery through this. As I mentioned earlier, this is a validated model, it's a time-tested model, this is a sustainable one, we are in the process of expanding this, we are possibly within a year's time we will have at least one or two clusters of 10 to 12 hospitals each, within another three years uh, we will have nearly 100 hospitals in five to six clusters. Extremely affordable, meets local needs. Right now we are operating only in peri-urban areas, not in the rural markets, because we are not sure about the load in that place. Highly competitive and easily replicable in any developing country, and it is scalable. And as I mentioned earlier, innovation is all about treating each and every person in the same manner. Each and every life has got the same value. Our objective is to bring happiness and delivering more babies with more smiles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are running about 15 minutes late. I don't think we'll have time for interaction. My apology. I'd like to invite now Jeff to take over. We have very interesting couple of sessions. We have a session now on learning from global good practices. Then we have a session on education, media, and finally, closing session at the President's house, Rastapati Bhavan, at around 5.30. But we must leave from here at 4.30, I'm told. And we'll keep you posted on the details. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank all our speakers. Okay, I, I suggest we, we make a start, even though a few people are still on their bio breaks. Um, but I'm keen that we do have some time in this session for uh, comment or questions. We're talking about how we learn from global best practices. We have people from many countries in the room. Uh, and we've seen many examples already in the last... 24 hours, and one of the questions I'm sure we will come to is, is how do you learn, how do you transfer, how do you replicate what works in one place may not work quite the same way in another place, what works in one time may not work quite the same way in another time, and what works for some people may not work for a slightly different group of people, and yet all of us probably have come here in part because we know we are stimulated 
uh, and provoked and encouraged by seeing great things being done in other parts of the world. So we have um, five speakers uh, for this session, so rather fewer than in some of the other sessions. I will uh, encourage you all to keep to hopefully around nine minutes or so. Threatening way. A threatening way. And if we actually get to nine minutes or, or ten minutes, I will clink my glass so that we do have some time for conversation. And I'm sure we would all want to hear you speak more, but uh, let's see if we can have a little bit of interactivity here. <laughs> yes. So our first speaker is uh, Fiorio Honself, a mayor of Udine in Italy. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. It's indeed a pleasure to be here. I will rush through my presentation. So I, uh, the, with my basic message is the new segment of society, uh, which are the, really the elderly, how you can promote innovation. We're all becoming uh, elder, even by, by the minute. And uh, I, hearing what the previous speakers were saying uh, that was so negative, well, I can give you an interesting message in my city. Uh, every 10 days, uh, a, uh, a new person becomes a centenary, has 100 years, and this ha probably happens uh, all over the world. And we have to provide uh, facilities for them to have a good uh, 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 welfare. And so this is what, uh, so the basic idea is promoting healthy lifestyles and, of course, even sustainable lifestyles. So, um, uh, l uh, basic principles, all of these uh, should be, of course, uh, uh, explained, but uh, the often less is more principle is very important. And, of course, I, what I call the Anhill principle, if you get, can get hold of these slides, you will, uh, uh, of course, uh, um, have more information. But uh, having to, to just rush through, I cannot go through this slide very. So, uh, Udine is here. Uh, it's a um, population we have to cater about 200,000 people. So the figures that I gave you earlier about uh, our size, uh, 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 look, look at uh, here, some more numbers. So one out of four of my citizens is uh, elderly, one over 65. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I'm, I was a former rector of the university, and so I like numbers. I am myself a mathematician, actually a computer scientist. So uh, um, I um, usually try to always have a good picture. Numbers uh, and uh, mathematical literacy is very, very useful. So uh, for instance, uh, water consumption or uh, uh, the, the production of CO2 uh, of my city. So this allows you to set very, very precise targets. So having good numbers, this is already a good message. Now this is the evolution of my population. This is how we were in 1936, a pyramid. So you can speak of the bottom of the pyramid. Now in 1970, we became a cylinder. So it's the bottom of the, and, uh, and here, is the shape in 2011. So you see it's a reverse, uh, uh, sort of a, not a reverse pyramid, of course, but it's different. So this is uh, the target I have to address. And of course, uh, healthcare is very expensive because of the recession is becoming even more expensive. So uh, of course, the issue of prevention is important. But look, this is something that I have learned. Societies, especially in Europe, become older and older and older. The average age is 46 in my city. But look, from 1990, we have stabilized the old age index, that is the number of people over uh, 65 uh, uh, as numerator, denominator is those under 14, has stabilized. So really this is a new segment. We are again on a, f on a fixed point. And of course families are becoming more uh, uh, smaller and smaller and smaller. We have a lot of single member families. So this is what we have to take care. Now this is one of the projects. Uh, of course uh, r refurbishing, uh, uh, re re rebuilding uh, existing uh, housing. So this is an example of a house with a lot of facilities. And one of our companies, a uh, um, very large company, building kitchens. 
Again, one of the principles I was telling you before is what is good for old people is good for all people. The, 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 what is good for disadvantaged people is good for all people. These people were building kitchens uh, for disabled. It turned out that the kitchens for disabled was their most successful item because everybody at some point can be uh, disabled. If, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, this uh, uh, it's an example, uh, if you build, a, uh, um, as a mayor, no, wh whatever uh, city planning you do, if you have in mind uh, some disadvantaged community, you build, you project a better city. So, uh, more statistics, but we do also something for the young population, of course. Unfortunately, not much, because 40% of them are unemployed, and uh, emerging sector sectors, of course, are social care, as we, we have seen, but of course many more uh, initiatives that I cannot go through, like co-working and meanwhile pop-up spaces, and of course uh, mm, the issue of green computing. Now, one of the principles is uh, a fair society. This is uh, the spirit level principle. Uh, what, is, uh, what happens is that in unequal societies, why do you have to address the bottom of the pyramid? Because in unequal societies, even the privileged people, even the privileged quintile or uh, uh, percentage is disadvantaged. Now this is the example. So the best societies are the, you see, where income inequality is lowest, uh, perform better in all uh, sectors. Uh, and and uh, ev while those which are, uh, of course, inequitable uh, do not perform that well. Um, now here are some snapshots of Udine. I can't go, but this is, and now, Everybody shows the nice things. Well, I show you also uh, inequities in Udine. So this is my uh, uh, informal settlements, uh, Roma, Roma settlement here. And uh, of course, uh, various forms of devotion, Tiepolo, uh, very nice, but also other forms of devotion in the Roma settlement, and here. So Italy, of course, it's, it's our, uh, G, uh, uh, our pro capite GDP is very high, but we have also inequities. We have to look for these. Uh, why I got involved with India is because one of the pioneers was Indology, uh, came from Udine, and he was one of the first to the understand the Harappa uh, and uh, Mohenjo-Daro uh, novelty. I have been ongoing projects, especially in Hyderabad, with the BM Birla company and the Science Center. We did many activities with them, especially a project which I think was interesting, building virtual uh, museums. Uh, it's called Idvara, as a homage to, to Dvara, you know, it means door in Sanskrit. And uh, as I said, in, I, I was going to speak about uh, 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 transnational city networks. So healthy cities is my uh, uh, in main source of inspiration. This is a the other. Uh, have to be plural. So, um, uh, covenant of mayors committing yourself to the, uh, uh, the reduction of the carbon footprint. I, this I have achieved in my city, you know, the 2020-20. By 2020, reducing by 20% the carbon footprint coming from fossil fuels. Well, I have achieved this as far as the municipality premises are concerned, but the city, unfortunately, did not perform that well. So what I need is to make my citizens smarter. So that's why I am speaking of promoting healthy and promoting sustainable lifestyles. Uh, um, and I can't go through this, 
I will show you my Jugad, you know, uh, Sam Pitroda is uh, here, one of the, the mentors. He, he wrote this, he uh, co-authored uh, co this book on Juda, Jugad, you know, this word of uh, uh, Indian word meaning frugal. And my example was I, I established a network uh, uh, of uh, uh, fiber, uh, very, very fast fiber in my city using sewage pipes. Uh, this is, uh, uh, of course, we, we, we have also this little robot that checks the sewage, uh, and uh, so uh, this is a very nice blending. But uh, more uh, can, can be said. I, now I will, here I'm trying to make my children smarter as well. With, with, uh, yeah. uh, th uh, here, uh, this is Pi Day uh, Mathematics, promoting mathematics with the elderly. Uh, th this is the Indians have the world uh, record as far as the uh, number of digits of the pi by heart. But you see, this elderly man here uh, in Udine performed uh, something like a thousand digits, so not bad. Uh, 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 Udine is healthy city. Now I will. I, will, I am. Uh, well, this is. Uh, uh, well, uh, I can't go through this. These are our elderly playing uh, uh, domineering, domi domino, uh, coming with a bicycle. Mm, yeah. And uh, I have healthy health maps in my city, of course, because I, whenever, it, it, say, you want to decide where to put a new bus stop, you have to know where your elderly people live. So here is bus stops, uh, uh, okay. Uh, or, um, uh, I, I, I can't really. Uh, this is a good intergenerational activity, going to school on foot. Hmm? Uh, at least children get to school uh, awake. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, thank you very much. I have many more examples, as I said, multiple strategy, but I have to abide by the time regulation. So thank you for your patience and attention. Well, th th thank you very much. Uh, I Italy gave the world slow food, so we are very grateful to you for fast talking. Yeah. <laughs> and we can digest at leisure uh, so all the uh, fascinating things you've just shown. Uh, our spec second speaker is Dr. Tubes uh, Prata from, uh, from the government of Brazil. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning for all of you. I'm going to, to explore an, an initiative that uh, has just been launched by, by the Brazilian government and uh, is inspired by some other initiatives that, uh, uh, that exist in different parts of, of the world, but uh, also using some uh, previous experience that uh, we have uh, in the agriculture uh, business. As I, I mentioned uh, yesterday, Brazil over the years was able to, to develop a good science. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, we are well ranked according to, to, to science and generation of knowledge. But for many reasons, we, we have not been able to successfully use this uh, science uh, in a more effective way to improve our, our social inequalities and to improve our economy, even though we are the, the seventh uh, economy in the planet, uh, we are very based in, in, in commodities. And uh, we want to, to do more for our industry and we want to spread our science in, in a more effective uh, way. Fifty years ago, Brazil used to import uh, food. And uh, in, in the last 50 years, we made a lot of progress regarding especially agriculture. And uh, in, in those two, two figures, you, you can see, I'm sorry, the numbers are, are very small, but on the top, you can see uh, the change in uh, increase in area, which, which are the columns, uh, the reddish columns. Is on the top figure, you, you starts in 1991 and goes up to, to today. In the low figure, the dark part of the, of the graph starts in, 
which starts in 1975 and goes up to today, show the, the increase in area. So if you go to the lower figure, uh, in the last 35 years, increasing 45% uh, of, the, of the area used for harvest, we were able to, to improve our production by 300%. And uh, in, the last four, in the last 10 years, for instance, our, our soybean production has uh, doubled, even though the increase in, in, uh, in area was only 25%. And uh, we're able to, to accomplish that, uh, especially because of Embrapa, which uh, is a, is, a, is a Brazilian enterprise to promote uh, agriculture research. And uh, Embrapa has a very interesting model. Uh, it spreads all over the country with uh, 47 research units and uh, 16 business office uh, and, and uh, employing more than 10,000 10, uh, people. Most of them are, are researchers. And uh, uh, with Embrapa, uh, we very successfully uh, accomplished this, uh, this uh, relationship between science, uh, which most of our science is generated in uh, universities, and, uh, and, uh, and the business sector. So inspired by this model, and uh, uh, observing that uh, we have been in increasing and improving uh, our 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 science and uh, the, the knowledge generated by by the good science, and uh, we are eager to to use more this knowledge uh, for for economics and, and and social benefits. So, and uh, looking for similar institutions in different parts of the world, but especially the Fraunhofer Institution uh, in, in Germany, and also the the, the Carnot Institute in, in, in France, we created uh, Embrapi. So we are changing the, the A, which stands for agriculture, by two I's, which is uh, industrial innovation. And, uh, and we created this Embrapi, different than uh, what we heard uh, yesterday and this, this morning. In Brazil, we usually don't have pilots. We usually create things and uh, start to operate. But in this case, we, we created a, a pilot because uh, we wanted to learn a, a little bit from, from the pilot experience before we launched the, the real program. And uh, from 2011, 2012, we had this pilot experience in which we, we selected three institutions to be units of uh, Embrapi, uh, uh, one institution uh, which is related to Sao Paulo State and another institution which is a federal institution and the third one which is ran by, by the Federation of Industries in Brazil. So different institutions and the way that uh, they deal with industry. And uh, from that uh, we, we, we learn and uh, we, we establish uh, the constraint, the legal constraint, uh, procedures, and the way that uh, people manage a project. And, uh, and we launched uh, Embrapi in uh, 2013. So what, uh, what we want from Embrapi is more or less uh, what we had from Embrapa. The difference is, is for Embrapa, we had to create this 47 uh, centers all over uh, Brazil. And for Embrapi, what we are doing, we are crediting laboratories that, has, uh, that have infrastructure already established and good people and uh, have uh, experience of, uh, of uh, conducting project with uh, industrial sector. And uh, once we accredit accreditate those, uh, those institutions, we give resources and money to those uh, laboratories in advance, and uh, we, we demand them to, to, to contract projects uh, with uh, industrial sectors. 
and uh, and those are are the three uh, pilot uh, institutions and uh, and uh, the interesting thing is uh, usually people uh, demand for resources and, uh, and especially for money f to 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 develop uh, and uh, to run uh, technological projects and in this case uh, what we observe is that uh, from the pilot uh, institution is that uh, they had a hard time negotiating with uh, with the companies especially regarding uh, intellectual properties uh, issues and uh, and uh, they were not able to spend all the many money that we provide them for for the the, the projects and uh, and the main features of this embrapi uh, system is uh, is uh, its capillary so we want to to spread uh, those institutions all over all over the countries we want to rely on the existing infrastructure and the existing capability and competence and uh, related to both uh, physical infrastructure and uh, human uh, qualifications and, uh, and uh, human resources and uh, we want to follow and uh, those uh, it those units for four years, so they will be they will be uh, accredited for four years, and after four years, we are going to renew or not their their accreditation. So, those are the elements of Embrapi. Uh, the government enters with uh, one third of the, the the investment for for the research projects. The laboratories uh, enters with the other one third, and industry with the third one third for the for the projects so uh, we of course have some uh, some uh, strategic uh, areas and those are the ones that uh, we want to focus but uh, all the units uh, are are welcome to 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 be part of embrapi no matter in which fields they 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 operate, but uh, those are the main uh, uh, the main sectors that uh, we want to focus. And uh, we are we are very we are very enthusiastic about uh, these initiatives from uh, uh, the results. Uh, even though we don't uh, have uh, definitive results, but we are very enthusiastic about uh, the way we have established Embrapi. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Prata, for sharing that uh, the very ambitious program uh, in Brazil. And if I understand, one part of this is not just strategy for industrial innovation, but also to encourage greater business investment uh, in, in R&D. Um, our next speaker is William Danvers from the OECD. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, I already spoke yesterday about some of the work that the OECD is undertaking on innovation. And I wanted to take the opportunity today to uh, go into a little more detail on some of our work. One area to highlight is measurement. Um, without statistics, we're all just people with an opinion, however valuable that opinion may be. The, the late U.S. Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was also a former ambassador to India and innovative intellect, uh, once said, while we're all entitled to our po own point of view, we're not entitled to our own facts. Measuring the inclusiveness of growth and of, and of innovation can help show where uh, different countries and groups stand and can help in establishing meaningful, meaningful goals to aspire to. What and how we measure is important and existing measurements often drive the policy discussion, although sometimes in the wrong direction. For example, in many countries the debate on science and innovation has only recently moved away from a narrow focus on R&D as the key indicator of innovation performance. And much of the debate on economic growth is still narrowly focused on GDP, rather than on broader indicators of well-being and welfare. Uh, this is an area where the OECD is constantly seeking to improve the breadth and width of measurement uh, so that it captures the key aspects of inclusive growth and innovation. And last month, we published our biennial Science, Technology, and Industry Scoreboard, which includes a wide range of new indicators, 
many beyond the usual scope of science and innovation policymakers. And in September, we were asked by the G8 to explore global developments in social impact investment, scoping the size and growth of this emerging market. This work will be a challenge, but should enhance our understanding of an emerging area that is of great importance to the debate on inclusive growth. And a second area I wanted to highlight today is the importance of entrepreneurship and young firms for innovation and job creation. Our recent work, as uh, my colleague Dirk mentioned yesterday, finds that young firms five years old or less accounted for only about 20% of non-financial business sector employment over the past decade, but generated nearly half of all new jobs. And in Brazil, over 70% of new jobs are created in these young firms. We also found that during the recent economic crisis, most of the jobs destroyed were the result of old businesses downsizing, while net job growth in young firms remained positive. Young firms are not only important for job creation, but are often also more innovative than existing firms, coming up with radical new ideas, including new business models that are more sustainable and inclusive. Creating the room for the entry and growth of these young firms is a challenge. Red tape remains a challenge in many countries, including India. Reducing the regulatory burden can make it easier for entrepreneurs to enter the market and to test new ideas and business models. Reforming bankruptcy legislation is important, too, and can help give potential entrepreneurs a second chance. Improving access to financing, including through well-designed support programs to risk capital, is also of crucial importance in, and is one area where we still need to develop good practices. And my final point concerns the importance of international uh, uh, openness and cooperation for innovation. International cooperation helps share the costs of large-scale research and innovation projects, reduces redundancies, pools resources, and helps combine the strengths of different countries. Countries that engage the most in international cooperation, even if they are relatively small, often produce research with the highest impact. India is already integrated in the global knowledge system. Over a quarter of Indian patent cooperation treaty patent applications between 2007 and 2011 were produced in international collaboration and 19% of scientific articles were published with foreign co-authors. But in India, as in many OECD and emerging economies, more progress can be made to further strengthen international cooperation and enhance the openness of the science and innovation system. Good practices continue to evolve. What worked well a decade ago and in a specific context may no longer work today. We therefore need to work together to constantly evaluate and exchange experiences, modifying our thinking and policies as needed. This is particularly important in the area of inclusive growth, where countries experience similar challenges but follow quite different tracks. The round, this roundtable is one good opportunity to exchange good practices. We offer the OECD as another platform for such exchange, and one specific me mechanism that I would like to mention in this context is the innovation policy platform that we have developed jointly with the World Bank as an international based platform for an exchange on good policy practices. Thank you, and under the time limit, I think. You're, you're well within your time. There you go. So you'll get, you'll get some extra at the end. That's good. <laughs> I look Thank forward you. to it. Thanks very much. And the, the STI scoreboard, for those of you who haven't seen it, is an extraordinary sort of treasure trove of data, much of which didn't really exist even a, a few years ago. Um, thank you so much for keeping to time, uh, and hopefully that will allow us more time for, for question and comment. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Gokali from Tetra Pak. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. So I, I, I work for a company that is 60 years old, about 60, 62 years old, and I would dare say that one thing that we've learned in Tetra Pak is that if we don't constantly innovate and if we are not sustainable, then we will die or we will not be competitive, certainly. 
Um, data Pack is, is steeped in the values of innovation and sustainability, and it's really not surprising that Data Pack is a Swedish company, and uh, I think this is uh, something that reflects the Scandinavian heritage more or less. Today we are, of course, the world's leading supplier of uh, aseptic food processing and packaging solutions. Well, it is our founder, Dr. Ruben Rousing, who said that doing something for the very first time is actually quite hard. And um, he also said, and that was one of his founding tenets, that a package should save more than it costs. Uh, today our vision, as we say, is that we commit to make food safe and available everywhere. So food safety is integral and at the core of what we do and what we deliver. But the other word I think that's very, very important here is available. And by available, one can read accessible as well as affordable. So safety delivered uh, affordably to consumers of the world uh, has to be accessible. And then there's one more very important thing, which is sustainability. And sustainability is also at the core of our growth strategy. In fact, it's one of our four strategic priorities for Tetra Pak. And, uh, and, and that sustainability is really brought out through the, through the value chain uh, or through the life of the, of the carton. Today what I'm going to do is to take three examples to demonstrate uh, how we in Tetra Pak promote inclusive and sustainable growth. And really these are three examples from different parts of our value chain. Uh, the first is talking about our initiatives in the, what we call the deeper in the, in the pyramid, and that's uh, a demand side uh, example. The second is the concept of dairy hubs, which is a supply side example of how we are linking small farmers to dairy processes around the world, especially in emerging economies. And then the third example is on how we are creating an ecosystem for sustainable recycling of used beverage cartons which is an example from the end of the life uh, part of the value chain. So starting with the, what we call the deeper in the pyramid project, for, for us the estimated number of consumers across the world in this DIP segment, which is somewhere of course between the top of the pyramid and the bottom, is uh, some two billion consumers. And I'm not sure whether you can read any of the stuff on the slide here, but Basically, we believe that there's a huge opportunity for us and for, for industry to engage in this deeper in the pyramid segment, which is, of course, over the next seven, eight years going to move into the top of the pyramid. And for us to be able to deliver to them uh, food, affordable food, nutritious food, uh, given cheap, but not cheap in quality, but in terms of what, what can really help them uh, through that journey. Uh, just to take one example, if you look at milk, of the 55, of 55 odd billion liters of loose milk that exists in the world, I believe, or more than 55, I think 70 billion, 55 would be in India and Pakistan alone, 40 billion is in India alone. That itself gives a huge opportunity to the dairy industry and to, to the food industry and to the packaging industry to provide uh, the right solutions. Um, we, along with our customers across the world, are identifying the right product opportunities uh, to, to serve the right uh, economy and basic, you know, the, the basic food formats to consumers everywhere. Um, there has been a number of new product launches in 2013 alone. Uh, one of the things that we do is, uh, is, to, is to look at how we can uh, help everyone from the supply side to the demand side um, of the value chain by providing uh, technology solutions and dairy development and food development uh, aid. Uh, in, in, uh, one example is school milk programs, um, and, and it's estimated that last year alone, an equivalent of six to seven billion packages were delivered to school programs across the world, many of them, of course, being funded by, by governments. And I'll talk about the Dairy Hub model, uh, and, and the Dairy Hub model really makes it possible for small 
dairy farmers to be able to, um, to upscale and to improve their quality as well as the quantity of milk uh, that is delivered into, into the market uh, and basically allows them to link in to the dairy processes. Not, not really unlike the Anand pattern that of course all of us are familiar with in India, but of course we, we don't want to compare what the Anand pattern has, has achieved in India with what we are trying to achieve elsewhere. But uh, this, this model is from, this example is from Bangladesh. It's a, it's a, it's a modest uh, start, a modest effort, starting with two dairy hubs. And as you can see from the figures, there's a, a pretty good increase, a pretty good improvement uh, in terms of the milk yield as well as uh, collection. And of course, um, very importantly, the livelihood for the farmer, as well as the uh, employment opportunities. Last but not least, how are we creating an ecosystem for sustainable recycling of used cartons? As we grow, as Tetra Pak grows, and that means as consumers demand more and more healthy, safe foods, uh, what is undoubtedly, undoubtedly going to grow is the mountain of rubbish. Um, and if you don't do anything about it, then of course, the, the waste lands up in the, in the landfills, in the streams, and everywhere it's not supposed to land up. For us, of course, we don't consider that waste uh, because what is, what is universally seen as waste is actually a good, very, very good and valuable resource to somebody out there. What we've done over the years uh, and going way back to when we started developing markets such as Brazil um, and, and markets in, the, in, in Europe was to recognize that we needed to work with recyclers, with paper mills, with plastics recyclers, and also with NGOs and waste management agencies to try and develop an infrastructure for the sustainable collection and recycling of used cartons. Uh, cartons on the average contain 75% very, very high quality fiber, and the 25% that is not the fiber is also a very good resource. It's a, it's a combination of polyethylene and aluminum. And, um, and what, we've, what we've really tried to do here is to work um, with, the, with the value chain in order to make sure that the value of collection um, accrues to the waste picker. Uh, and in countries such as India, um, it is the waste picker that really forms the backbone of the, of the, uh, of the society and is instrumental in, make, in, in gathering uh, not only waste cartons, but all, uh, all waste. So what we've also done is, um, is innovate not only in terms of technology, in terms of food, but also in terms of uh, communication. So when we go out into the waste picker communities, we also have to use innovative mediums such as street plays in order to convey to them the benefits of collecting use cartons and the livelihood opportunities that accrue as a result. So that's in short what I wanted to talk to you about. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for sh sharing these, these very interesting uh, case studies and introducing the, the concept of deeper in the pyramid, which I think is, is quite important because one of the criticisms of the bottom of the pyramid idea from Prahalad was that if you look at societies like India or Brazil, and as you showed, in fact, they only look like pyramids if you're looking from the top down. <laughs> if you look from the side, they are more like sort of gourds or extended teardrops, and there's a little bit of a symptom of some of the BOP work as it's the world, the world view, in fact, from the top, not from the bottom. Anyway, maybe we can discuss that later. Um, our, our final speaker is uh, Dr. Goss from the uh, Embassy of Switzerland. Good afternoon, and I see, I, again, I'm the one standing between you and lunch, so I will try to be, try to be brief. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Mr. Petroda and his team for inviting Switzerland to be present at this occasion. Unfortunately, nobody from Switzerland is present here today for coming from Switzerland because as we are in a meeting here at the Global Innovation Roundtable, uh, the Swiss Innovation Forum is meeting today and, and for the rest of the week in Basel this week. Uh, um, about Tetra Pak, uh, 
in the previous presentation. We're not allowed to throw any Tetra Pak uh, cartons away at home for the rag picker because my son takes them to his school where they get recycled. So even the schools have been brought into, into, that, uh, into that process. Uh, now coming to my presentation, it's, it's going to be different from what we've heard so far. Uh, when, we saw the, when we saw the topic, we wondered, uh, title, we wondered what we should present. And finally we said, okay, Switzerland is successful in innovating and let's just present that. Uh, so we have a pompously titled presentation called The Secret Behind Swiss Innovation. I don't think it's unique to Switzerland, but I'll show shortly, briefly what we've done uh, in Switzerland. Uh, so some vital statistics about Switzerland. I mean, Switzerland is a small country with no natural resources of its own, so innovation is not a luxury, but uh, it's a necessity and a way of life. Uh, we are a small, small country with a population of uh, 8 million people, which is about half the size of Delhi. Four official languages, um, 27 independent governments almost, uh, and a GDP in 2012 of uh, 591 billion uh, Swiss francs for a GDP per capita of uh, over 73 billion, um, sorry, 73,000 Swiss francs uh, GDP per capita. So this is an anecdotal slide, some famous Swiss inventions. So the logarithmic table or the programming language Pascal came out of Switzerland as did chocolate as we know it today and blocks as well as LSD. So, some of the key, fa key factors for innovation in Switzerland, I mean, these are not unique to Switzerland, I'm sure they are, as I said, done everywhere, but uh, I'll speak briefly. So, we, we believe that successful innovation requires a well-trained force, uh, workforce, and excellent academic institutions. We have a good dual education system and a strong SME se sector and high R&D expenditure also need diverse uh, funding possibilities and um, in Switzerland the main, um, in addition to what comes out of mainly Swiss industry, Switzerland is completely integrated into the EU research framework program that we've, uh, that has been alluded to Horizon 2020 and framework program 7 which has been alluded to yesterday and also the free freedom for creative thinking. Um, if you look at some of the professors at Swiss universities, they don't speak any of the official languages and the gentleman who describes himself as the foreign minister of the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich is actually not even a Swiss national. So Switzerland's always been very, very open to, open to people from outside and uh, we'll hear more. So talking about the well-trained workforce, uh, more than 90% 90, 90 of young Swiss people have a, have a secondary training. Uh, they either which trains them either to go into the university system or into vocational, uh, vocational education, which prepares them for the marketplace. Um, the federal expenditure on education and research um, is the fourth largest, um, fourth largest uh, component of uh, federal spending uh, in Switzerland. In 2012, something like uh, over six billion uh, Swiss francs were spent on uh, res education and research, which represented uh, almost 11% of um, federal spending um, in Switzerland in 2012. There's a large workforce involved, uh, employed in SNT related activity, uh, something like 22% uh, as of now. Switzerland has some excellent academic institutions. So if you look at the, mm, there are in Switzerland 12 universities which, uh, are carry, out, uh, which carry out research and also offer doctoral degrees. Uh, and of these 12, uh, Seven, seven of them are in the top 200 of uh, all the university ranking systems, whether it be the Shanghai system, the QS, or the Times, Times rating. So 80% of Swiss students in the research or doctoral universities uh, study in one of the top 200 universities in the world. In addition, there's a large network of some 26 universities of applied sciences, which prepare people for, for the workforce. Uh, there is again, uh, sorry, I have something wrong here. So I mentioned the dual education system. So not everybody in Switzerland goes into one of the research uh, or doctoral universities. Uh, at about the age of 16, 
people go through, and uh, young Swiss people go through an examination, uh, which either gives them the maturity certificate, which leads them to towards one of these 12 doctoral universities or to the universities of applied sciences. Of course, there are linkages possible. Uh, one can go over from one system to the other, but uh, pretty early, uh, pretty early in their lives, people people know more or less where they are going, and. Uh, Approximately 33% of uh, Swiss students get the maturity certificate, while 60% uh, go on to go on to an apprentice uh, apprentice-based uh, education. There is an extremely strong SME sector in Switzerland. 99.7% uh, of uh, Swiss enterprises are SMEs, which are really small companies, less between 50 and 2, um, I mean, less, uh, up to 250 employees or less. And these account for 66% of, uh, of employment uh, in the private sector. The big companies, and we count uh, just over 1,000, are represent only 0.3% of, uh, of Swiss companies. Um, and uh, for the SMEs, there is strong governmental support through the Commission for Technology and Innovation. Switzerland has had a long-standing uh, history of uh, re su support for research and innovation. Our two federal institutes of technology, the one in Lausanne and the one in uh, Zurich, were started respectively in 1853 and 1854, so they're over 150, 150 160 years old. Uh, and way back in 1943, we, uh, we established two funding institutions uh, for university-based research. Uh, uh, one is the Swiss National Science Foundation for, applied, uh, for Basic Research and the Commission for Technology and Innovation, which I had mentioned previously, which funds applied research. Uh, uh, R&D expenditure in Switzerland is over 3% of GDP, two-thirds coming from the private sector and uh, one-third from the public. And in 2012, the total R&D expenditure was something like $16 billion 16 billion Swiss francs. Uh, one minute. Okay, I'll go quickly. Uh, so, if you look at the top, um, if you look at the to to 2012, the top uh, companies uh, spending uh, spending on R&D uh, in the top ten from the e this from the EU barometer, um, uh, the industrial uh, R&D scoreboard. Uh, Two of the top ten university uh, of the companies are from Switzerland, and if I was to expand this list to 100, we'd find five uh, Swiss companies represented. And then uh, this is a slide you saw yesterday. So again, in the latest uh, latest uh, global innovation ranking, Switzerland was ranked number one, uh, as it has been since 2011. And Switzerland uh, is one of the three countries, the other two being uh, Netherlands and Singapore, which have been in the Global Innovation Index uh, for all the, all the seven years, uh, sorry, all the six years in which uh, this ranking has come out. And this is my last slide. We don't do this, um, we don't do this in isolation. So Switzerland has a strong education, research, and innovation network. Um, outside, outside, of Sw outside of Switzerland, we are present in uh, 23 cities in, uh, no, sorry, I should make that, 24 cities in 19 countries. Uh, either through a Swiss Nex, uh, which are the research outposts of Switzerland, or through science and technology counselors and science and technology officers in the Swiss embassies, uh, including, um, as far as India is concerned, we have a Swiss Nex in Bangalore and a science and technology office in New Delhi. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hoss. And uh, it does make me wonder, seeing Switzerland and Sweden at the top of those rankings, whether the fact that both countries have kept out of any military entanglements for such a long time may be one of the factors behind their success. Switzerland has a defense attaché in New Delhi. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have maybe 10 or 15 minutes for not just questions, but perhaps also comments. And we've had five uh, very impressive, very complimentary presentations here. Um, your thoughts on what struck you from them, but also about the broader question of this session. How, how do ideas spread, and how can one country perhaps copy some of what's been so successful in Switzerland and transplant to a different environment? So please indicate if you would like to um, come in and make a question or a comment. 
now and we have from business and universities how about opening the research that is happening in defense what what, what do you mean exactly by opening uh, sir what we understand is that there's a lot of research happening in the in the defense related uh, okay. organizations of india like drdo mm. and there are products which are which are which can be used by the military and some which are not used by the military or for defense purposes can we open that research once it is declassified in the way us does can we open that and how does these three things tie in business universities and defense so that the bottom of the pyramid can benefit 